Welcome everyone and thank you for being with us this evening for our Cambridge Laser with CRASH. CRASH is the Centre for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities at the University of Cambridge. It's a truly interdisciplinary hub. For those of you joining the Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous for the first time, this is part of the International Laser Talks created at Stanford University and it's supported by the International Society for Art, Science and Technology and the MIT Leonardo Journal, a global platform for art and science. And we're delighted to be part of this movement. The Cambridge Laser is part of the vibrant arena of art and science in Cambridge that explores how scientific and artistic attitudes, inquiries, methods overlap and essentially differ, and how such an understanding can help shape our fu future for an ecologically and socially sustainable life and well-being. Um, today's laser is part of a series on rhythmicity and will focus on health and well-being. Recent pandemic years have seen us become increasingly dependent on technology to mediate our connections. And even after the lockdowns have, uh, ha have taken place, you know, our world is, has changed. A number of us are actually still working from home. Um, and this impacts on how we connect as social and empathic animals. Um, stress and feeling overwhelmed also places such pressure on us. For example, those working in the care and therapeutic services where being empathic is vital for care. Um, research from music and science and the experiences of artists working with communities reveals that when we're able to move our bodies and voices in rhythm together, we feel better about ourselves and those around us, even boosting our immune system and enabling us to engage empathically with each other and significantly with the differences between us. In this laser discussion, we're bringing together a neuroscientist working within music therapy and three very different artists who use their skills in professional clown technique, in dance and in sound and media art to engage with communities through participatory and collaborative art processes that involve play, bodily movement and sound. And in doing so, they're fostering a positive experience of oneself and of other and shaping inclusive dialogue. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker, Philippa Ferreira Stubbs. Um, Philippa is a Cambridge based dance artist, a dance teacher, and a creative practitioner with 30 years of experience in dance and health and in community art. Her current core projects include Dance for Health at the University Hospitals here and Dance at the Museum, and which holds inclusivity and integration of arts at the core finding inspiration in somatic pra practice and processes of improvisation and imagination and bridging perceived cultural differences, age differences and health. It's so wonderful to have us with her. Um, I just want to say, you know, she, her work in the field of medicine also seeks to create, very importantly, bridges between subjective and phenomenological perspectives of the body and the larger naturalist and normative approaches to medicine, health and well-being, which is very important. So without further ado, Philippa. Thank you, Satin. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm actually situated in the hospital at the moment. I'm at the Rosie, um, uh, which is our maternity hospital. So if I look like I'm every so often just looking around, it's because I'm on the alert for, for um, babies being born. Um, but it should be fine. Um, there's other professionals here to look after them. So I'm going to talk really um, about the work that I do here at the hospital. Um, I, my role is as a dance artist. I trained as a dance movement therapist. And in that work, uh, I worked in the NHS very much in the areas of dementia and the old age of psychiatry, psychiatry of old age even. Um, but I felt as my journey with the NHS continued that it was really imperative that the role of the arts was maintained and protected in the sense that this is such a clinical environment and with a huge emphasis, um, a very well-meaning need for research and a fascination with how we can really um, help people with their health needs, with their physical health needs, with their mental health needs. Um, it's a very medical environment. And with funding issues and all sorts of commissioning problems, there's often a need to create ready-made packs to help people with their health. And 
um, in this world of increasing diversity and increasing complexity of health needs, it felt like it was important to have a space where the arts could do their thing. And I know Amanda will talk to this a little bit more, but the thing is the ability to listen, the ability to listen to what is going on in your body for yourself. Now, that seems like such a simple thing to do, you know, close the door, turn the music off, turn your phone off, just sit quietly. But it is actually one of the most complex things you can do on a clinical ward where there is a multitude of health professionals coming in and addressing themselves to your problems, you know, your knee, your cancer, your diabetes. What rarely happens is the ability for the patient to gain agency into both the diagnosis, the prognosis, the rehabilitation, or even the care that goes into becoming a patient, the pre-patient care. So people arrive in hospital and the NHS being what it is in England, in the UK, you have to be really complexly ill to get into the NHS. It's like a very special club, you know? Not everyone gets in, I can tell you that. So when you get in, there's a lot going on. People are often um, highly anxious, um, bewildered, discombobulated. There's a sense of shame. There's a sense of how did I get here? Um, a lot of bewilderment about how they're going to get back out again. So the arts in this environment provides that space where people can remember that a part of them is unwell, but a lot of them is just fine. They have got the resources. They have got the ability to engage with themselves and find what they need to find. So the first level of compassion and listening is the person to themselves. My role through music and movement, I am a dancer, but my role in this position is to almost create a theatre of one with each individual patient I find. I used to do groups, but the pandemic put an end to that. I can now only work one-to-one -one with patients. At first, I was horrified by that, and now I just love it because it means I can go to all the people who were not able to access the groups. These are the people who are curled up in a fetal position. These are the people who look like they've died and nobody's noticed. These are the people who just brim up with pain and tears and fear anytime anybody goes near them. I work on neurorehabilitation, diabetes, endocrinology, pediatrics, oncology, stroke, Department of Medicine for the Elderly. So I'm seeing tiny babies all the way up to 100 year olds who are often very fit, <laughs> the 100 year olds, and have fantastic musical choices. I approach them, I ask them how they are, I ask them who they are, I give them the opportunity to introduce themselves to me, and that's where the first inclusive interaction begins. How are you? Who are you? What's going on? Because I'm working as an artist, I have permission to engage with people as slowly, as fully, as richly as the situation merits. I'm very aware of how privileged this position is. I watch my colleagues and they're rushing, they're doing 20 minute interactions, 20 minute diagnoses. I'm able to sit with somebody for a long time. What happens in that process of sitting is I can begin to listen to what's going on. I can bring the musical choices to match the need. So sometimes people need to um, relax. Sometimes they need to breathe. Sometimes people need to be soothed. They need to be reassured. My hands, my listening hands, offer themselves as a support, as a means of people coming into their own understanding of where they are in their body. So, Satinda, you introduced my work as phenomenological. It is. It's about bringing people into the now moment. How are you doing right now? What music do we need to support? Because I've been here for a very long time, I've been here 10 years because I'm incredibly um, persistent and determined. And if they say I can't do something, I go, okay, 
and then I just move to the next room and keep going anyway. So I've been here for 10 years. Um, the work is embedded. So when I come in, the nurses, their voices start to go down, doors close. People understand that if they're going to do uh, intervention like take blood or take the blood pressure, they can always come back. So they, they begin, the, the work is integrated so that the medical team can actually begin to support that quiet listening space. And then really that's where it takes from there. So each person, it's an individual experience. Sometimes we go into memory, sometimes we go into rhythm, rhythmical movement. Um, sometimes can get very, very energized. People can sing, people weep, all sorts of things happen. Often what happens is the staff who are in the room also begin to relax. They also can begin to cry. Um, other patients, sometimes we have six bedded units, sometimes we have three bedded units. They can um, join in. Uh, the idea of working in this way with the body means it's open to everybody. There's not a single dance step anywhere to be seen. There's no sense of this is the right way to move. Um, it's, it's really organic. It's, it's what can we do here together? How can we encourage you to feel better about yourself and 15 20 minutes later you've reached somewhere that feels like the option of being more developing equanimity about the, the place that people find themselves is is real it's not just a well i hope you feel better later they've actually physically brain body mind that's my holy trinity brain body mind they've understood the process if I'm lucky enough to go back on stroke, I can work with people for six to nine months. We build that, we build that practice. So many people have come into the hospital and discovered music and movement. Um, of course, the pain is then when they leave the hospital, which is great. There's no more music and movement. Where do they go? So actually, as an aside, we set up a, a stroke group at the Fitzwilliam, which is a whole other project. But um, it's just it's just lovely that that was that opportunity was there to um, bring people who I met on the stroke unit and bring them into a cultural setting to um, continue the work. I think there's a, a newly born dad just arriving here. Um, yeah, I'm, I can see pictures of a new baby. <laughs> so that's very exciting. But this might be a moment for me to hand over to the next person, Amanda. And, mute myself so so thank you everybody i'll join in in a minute okay <laughs> that was that was lovely uh, a lovely place to transition thank you so much Philippa. i think there's going to be lots of questions for you um i i think this aspect of people having a sense of their own bodies um it's, it's astonishing how in a hospital some of things are, are being done to us. Um, I remember you describing this early on when we first met, you know, that you don't, this the idea of having agency is so vital and so crucial. Um, um, that I would love to know more, and I'm sure people are going to ask you questions about how you see the shifts and changes in patients uh, recovering, for example, from an operation or um, um, maybe even in feeling more prepared before they even go into an operation or any kind of uh, any kind of treatment. Um, and um, and whether once they leave the hospital, this this is also very important is once they leave, um what is available out there in the community and how one can think of how the nhs might be thinking about how to perhaps um, extend this out into um, aftercare and, and stuff but but that's um i think it, um but that was that was absolutely wonderful um uh, i think what we'll do is we'll go through the talks and then we'll come back with lots of questions um, I just want to say to the audience that um, Filippo will be leaving us at 7.30, so um, once we have the talks, please ask your questions um, before then. Um, I don't know what you think. Do you want to take questions now? But I think we perhaps carry on now. Yeah. 
that's kind of um, sorry. So I'd like to introduce our, our next our next speaker, who is Amanda Keller. Uh, Amanda is awesome. Um, she's an award winning performer, a clown. She describes herself as a shape throw music magpie and overall loudmouth. Um, but she uses performance to explore and play with very serious subjects in, in what she describes as silly ways, such as human connection, female empowerment and the end of the world. Um, I know that Amanda's worked with young adults with great difficulties and I've always, I, I've been struck by her stories of um, how her work has enabled people who, who, who found it so hard to express themselves, to express themselves people who are self-harming to actually come out of that. Um, uh, it's, it's astonishing work. Um, and she's worked in internationally in Ireland, Italy, Southeast Asia, and she's toured the UK. Um, she's collaborated with composers, choreographers, and artists to make what she describes as multi-arts platform pieces that challenge and surprise her audience. Um, and, uh, and she's delivered these amazing dynamic artistry projects in the community. Um, she's also a contemporary theatre fellow at Birkbeck in London. Um, okay, over to you, Amanda. Thanks very much, Satinder. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, so as Satinder said, uh, my main art form is theatre. Um, I am quite a magpie. Um, I uh, practice a lot of music in my work and also lots of movement. As you heard in my introduction, I do like to throw a shape or two. So I usually say that I make silly shows about serious stuff. And I recently toured my fourth solo work, which employed storytelling, clown, movement and original soundscapes. And I've been delivering performing arts workshops for about two decades. I specialize in using performing arts techniques to improve mental health and well-being. And I've recently set up a new charity, which I'll talk about later. More recently, with the support of the Arts Council through a DYCP grant, I've been collaborating with neuroscientist Nicole Vignola on the real brain benefits of my work, which I found really fascinating and I'm going to touch upon in a moment. But first of all, I'm going to take a step back and begin to talk to you a little bit about my journey with rhythm uh, for well-being. So like most theatre makers, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. I'm going to go back to my staunchly working class background where people like me don't go into the arts. And I really felt I remember the express really clearly the day that changed for me was when I was seven and I was sat on the very cold floor of the school hall. And we were going to have a performance in our school, which was incredibly rare, so rare. It's the only one I remember. And we were sat in, I remember, in a very packed hall and suddenly onto stage sauntered a gorilla. And I was utterly transfixed. He slipped on a pretend banana, classic, and then suddenly he produced a cello. And he started to play Bach cello suites. Now, I didn't know that's what they were then until many years later, but it was absolutely stunning. And it removed me from my cold school hall into some concert venue, listening to this gorilla play this beautiful music while other performers on stage were falling and doing comedy acts around him, all punctuated with this beautiful music. It felt to me in the moment like he was just playing just for me. I think it was a he gorilla, I'm pretty sure. And at the end of it, I remember thinking, that's what I wanna do. I didn't want to be a gorilla, but I definitely thought I wanted to make people feel good and have that magic in my belly for my audience, the way that I had just felt about it. So let's touch upon performance first. So as I said, I make solo shows. Now, as a clown, my relationship with my audience is more important than my idea, which after my theatre training in drama school was very challenging for me. Now, there's a line in Clown where we say the difference between a comedian and a clown is that a comedian will tell you a joke and they'll make you laugh. But a clown will try and make you laugh and fail. And through their failure, they will connect with the audience 
And so the audience will laugh in recognition of the clown's failure and in fact, their own failures. And now that audience will feel like they're on the inside of the joke. They're part of the tribe with the clown. And there's a real rhythm to this work. It becomes really collaborative between the performer and the audience. Now, when I first came to clown, I found it really hard to slow myself down and just be with the audience. It's a style of performance that actually makes you quite vulnerable. And as a performer, I always practice breath work and I found that really helped connect me not only with my body and slowing down my stress levels, but also with my audience. Now, we know, of course, that breath work calms the central nervous system and it improves focus. And as a performer, it radically changed my energy and in time, my connection with the audience. It meant that I developed a deeper sense of listening, that I could surrender my ego and think, do I have my audience today? Are they with me? Am I losing them? How can I help them rejoin me on this journey? And what does that mean for an audience member? It's like when we fall into sync when we're walking together, the audience tend to relax and be more receptive and connected to the performer. In my workshops, breathwork has always been a really important building block for me in reducing people's anxiety and grounding them for the work that we'll do together. Now, people hear a performance workshop and they think, well, what am I going to do? Or is she going to make me be a tree? There are no trees involved. The workshops use games, movement and sound. And at their heart, they're playful explorations of the self. I found that no matter the group, whether it's young people, adults, refugees, survivors of violence, I was getting more and more reports of improved mental health. Through our evaluations, which we do throughout our sessions, people were reporting that they were calmer, more focused, more confident. So I knew anecdotally that it definitely worked. Now, as my work evolved, I started to work with people with more complex mental health issues. I worked in East Timor, fresh from 25 years of genocide, where every person in the room generally had a direct experience of extreme violence. Most, if not all of them, had PTSD. And I did worry that my playful approach might seem, might make them feel too vulnerable or too exposed. Even breath work was a challenge for those with experiences of trauma, because often those with trauma struggle with diaphragmatic breathing. You take up more space, your body is more open. There is a rhythm, of course, to breath work. But there was a real turning point for me in you and how I use rhythm in my groups one day. So I was in East Timor, halfway up a mountain in Swai, and someone had forgotten to bring me a translator. So I'm in a town that hadn't had hardly any outsiders. I spoke no Tetum and they spoke no English. And I was fully aware that they all looked totally terrified, fresh from trauma and also confronted with a big white Irish woman. Uh, I don't blame them. And I could see the shallow, quick breathing and all the physical markers for high stress. And I thought to myself, I don't know what I'm going to do here. And so I clapped. And then I pointed at someone else and so on and so on. I hadn't spoken one word, but suddenly we were playing together. I played the clapping game because I thought it would help with communication, but actually it changed everything. It just went far above that. The fidgeting stopped. The breathing calmed down, their shoulders relaxed. It was like a valve had released the stress from the room really quickly, just with a clapping game. And I didn't really know why or how, but I knew it worked. So I started making new rhythm games, call and response, collaborative in small groups and big groups and pairs. And I saw the same thing in groups in different countries. The rhythm was firstly acting as a primer to engagement, bringing people into the room but it also lowered their anxiety. I often play a clapping game now before I even know people's names, because for some people standing in a circle with strangers and saying your name loudly can be really scary. A new, a new activity with new people where you might get something wrong. 
But a clap is just a clap. A baby claps. When the individual is so focused on receiving and sending the clap all around the circle, where is it? I'm ready for it. I'm open. Their body language is opening up. I'm ready to send it out. I'm sending and I'm receiving and they're complicit in it. You have no time in your brain and your body to think, oh no, I'm going to get it wrong. I wish I wore the other jumper. Do they like me? I'm going to get it wrong. I'm worried. I'm embarrassed. I don't know what to do. There's just the clap. Instead of listening to your worries, you start to listen on a deeper level, just like the clown to your group, your new tribe. And that group really become a cemented group, working together to keep the momentum up, using the rhythm as a social glue or a social leveler. They're already a team and they don't even know each other's names yet. And I've seen how by focusing on the group, the individual person benefits. Their individual worries are suspended. Empathy pathways in the brain are strengthened by connecting with others. The heart and breathing will start to sync up in a type of coherence breathing. Through movement and the use of music, we are in fact connecting with a form of pain relief. And York can tell us more about this. We've been exploring how the endocannabinoids, if I'm saying that right, York, work in conjunction with the opioid receptors in the brain to numb pain when we move and exercise together, as well as all the empathy pathways that are lighting up in the brain. And yes, you'll drop the clap and you'll probably fail. And we practice really safe, playful failure. That's the power of playfulness. It activates the default mode network in the brain, something Nicole and I have really been exploring. It's the part of the brain I found out that yes, it's the place for rumination, but also it's the place for amazing creativity. So if we're upregulating the DNS, it actually can strengthen those connections in the brain instead of negativity towards creativity. In workshops, I'm still thinking about connecting to my inner clown. That is a looking at the rhythm of connection and listening and collaboration. Whatever activity we do that day, I always really like to wind up with a sharing because I really believe there's a great power in being watched, of being accepted by your new tribe. You're safely vulnerable and it's rewarded. So maybe you can explore that in other areas of your life. There's also a great power, I believe, in watching the catharsis. You recognize yourself in their mistakes. It resonates with you. You learn from them and them from you. It moves you like me with a gorilla. All of that brings me to Good Mood Creative, which is my brand new charity, which has big ambitions. We want to make everyone feel good. And we're planning on doing that through delivery. We have plans for delivery of theatre, music and movement projects from young people to a men's mental health project using music in Norfolk to adults across many settings. And we're also going to do research. The arts sometimes can lag behind in evaluation and research, a lot of the times because of funding. And the more I learn about the brain, the more I really believe that as humans, we have so much more power over be our behaviors than we thought and it makes me want to learn more so we're collaborating with scientists and academics and the nhs to find out why and how it works and how we can help our our participants to empower themselves and so that's it we're currently designing new evaluation with educational psychologists so we can do what we do and do it to the best way we can we just want people to feel free to play and to feel good and to find their own gorilla. And maybe actually they'll be their own gorilla and a gorilla maybe to someone else. Thank you, Amanda. This has been um, um, focusing both of our both of our first panelists actually talked about the listening process, listening to self, 
listening to other. And uh, the next one, Jörg Fachner, is a professor of music health and the brain and the co-director of the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research at the Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge. His research does actually just that. He was going to show us biomarkers of the listening process. And um, his research has been spanning over 20 years, focused on re brain research and music technology for analyzing and evaluating music therapy processes and outcomes. He's involved in music therapy driven social neuroscience research, and his projects are funded with EU and national grants in Germany, Austria, Finland, the UK. Thank you. That's a nice introduction. Well, um, well, I'm a musician, actually. What should I say? I'm not, you know, like a like a trained medic and neuroscientist, but as a musician, I became so obsessed from looking at brain waves because I was I was kind of thinking, well, this is something that tells me about what is happening in my brain in time, and maybe there's a chance that we can see something. Um, connected between me and the others and funnily enough I mean when when the EG started which is electroencephalogram uh, it started to yeah based on a on a on a story from that Mr. Berger I'm, I'm not sure why I'm telling this story now but why not it's just coming um, so and he saw and heard and felt his brother dying in the battlefield you know, in the last century, 1870, whatever. And so he felt very much connected and he always wanted to find out well, how is that happening? So he started looking into the research that was done with, with apes and, and the electricity in the brain. And then he was interested in that uh, brain waves that they were recording. So then he started doing that with, yeah, with um, human beings and neurology developed and that EEG tool also developed, but he never found, you know, how that made him connected to his brother. So this kind of deep connection, which is now, of course, then he got into parapsychology. So let's not go there. there. Um, but um, what I very much interested in, I'm sharing stuff right now. I, let me see if that works. And sorry if I can't get away from you know, from this presentation type of, but you see what you, what you see there is a dementia patient and a music therapist and <laughs> EG caps. <laughs> so um, as a musician, I'm quite interested, what is happening when they're drumming together? Is there something that, you know, makes that connection in the music making visible with these brainwaves not in the way that Berger kind of was hoping but yes I mean it's not that far we can we can analyze uh, how the social brain is interacting by looking at the data so that was something that he may have liked very much which is now possible Mr. Berger and I just changed my title into closer to the here and now because that was what I've heard in the other talks before from from Philip and also then from uh, from Amanda, so this kind of presence where you are with your, let's say, patients or with your audience, where a musician would say, I'm rocking the house when I'm doing the right way of moving and, and playing and really sensing what is going on. And this term sensing is so, has become so important for me because it's related to our body, to the way how we embody it. And well, how can we get there to this nonverbal kind of uh, interactive uh, signals? And one of the ways is going into the technology that social neuroscience is offering us and that may help us also how we are dancing together as Condon has you know put that in his frame to frame analysis where he was looking in how people are interacting and see that there's a certain way of dancing when people understand each other when they're relaxed or when they are really you know when yeah when this energy uh, flow uh, happening in a positive way well um not getting uh, sidetracked here so why am i interested also where in this study when we are music therapy we want to show the music therapy is effective of course and uh, then we do all these randomized controlled trials where we use um, measures that are not coming out of the arts they're coming out of somewhere else but these are the accepted ones in the medical sciences 
and we were showing that music therapy and depression treatment in a work in Finland was working. But well, how does it work? That is the question. And I'm interested in this, as I said, the process research and also uh, the social neuroscience, because in music therapy, and we've seen that with Amanda and also with, uh, with Filippo, uh, that there is this interactiveness going on. So, and in the social neuroscience, we think, well, there's neural underpinnings of that social interactive behavior, as I said it. And if you look at that uh, picture here right now and all that um, frequencies here, you can see that they are overlapping, that one of them is before or is behind. Uh, it depends on how you look at it. So the interesting bit of, again, the EG is, to look at what is happening at a certain time when we are in a state of empathy, yeah? Or when we are understanding each other, when we are in a joint attention, and then, well, we need to know if this is what the person are experiencing. So that's something for the, you know, the setup of the, yeah, of the observation, and then see uh, how that is really happening in the real world, in real world practice. And that's something also that has come in from the social neuroscience to look into the real world uh, settings. And because music therapy processes are quite individualized, as what we've heard also again from Amanda and uh, Philippa, it's an individualized, um, yeah, targeting and uh, finding out what is it, what is needed. So, um, we cannot do that in therapy by kind of following a certain ritual of a experimental design because that is impeding us from doing the work by really getting closer to the patient to understand. So what we can do so with these methods is to accompany what is going on and then look into the data later on. That's what we've done. Why are we also doing that? Well, when we have our patients, well, there is... Uh, change of course happening but this change is related to certain parts in the therapy where there's let's say a certain emotional peak and that peak might be related to another peak in the session i'm not sure if you can see my arrow moving can somebody nod yeah okay cool um and that is yeah it's a particular story of a change of a person and the way how we're interacting with that patient in the therapy. So what is uh, of interest then for me is to look at these moments in which the therapy seems to be effective or seems to be working or where contact is, is built up, where empathy seems to be present uh, in the way how I as the therapist are trained to recognize and to sense that and then choose these moments and compared to moments, for instance, where that is not happening, although there's a peak. Yeah, right. So this is a way of, of going into that moments of interest and no interest. And then you have a lot of possibilities to find out what the people are saying, what the context factors are, what it is meaning. And we have video and we can see how nonverbal interaction works, body language. We can read all that so that we have that multimodal um, data stream that we then can uh, align with the EEG. So that is like you have to have uh, several lines of data to really understand these, you know, these short moments. They may be two or three seconds, but they are of importance and uh, uh, for the patient when, when there's understanding. Well, and we have a study where we were looking into that a little bit more in, in detail. I don't want to go into that uh, biomarker. Basically what it gives us is the difference between that electrode here and that electrode there. It's a bit of a connectivity between the brain halves and it tells us about emotional processing. So left side of the brain positive, right side of the brain negative. Very simple concept but quite effective and uh, it has been studied in, in, in other um, social interaction studies and it reflects amygdala and um, anterior cingulate cortex and dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex activity related to yeah, also parts of um, the limbic system and uh, so uh, empathy related work. So, um, well, we were able to show in music therapy that the group that received music therapy was different uh, in terms of that um, alpha asymmetry. 
And now what we've done is to have a patient in a guided imagery setting that came in and said, well, I'm anxious that my daughter's, uh, no, that my son's um, daughter-in-law, uh, rubbish, uh, so my son's wife has been recently uh, diagnosed with cancer and she's wearing, she's having the baby. So, and she's undergoing chemotherapy. So the patient, as you can imagine, was quite anxious. Came into therapy, math therapist, and we were able to have these brain scans on. We were recording that with the video. We were asking them, okay, what was of importance in that session? And then in the end, we, we found out that even external rates said, well, it is this part. And I come to that part and we have another part here. And so um, we were looking into the first part in which the patient is describing how her own son, when uh, she had it and she was married and her, her parents said, well, how can you have a child by not being married? So better get rid of it, you know? And she was upset, of course, how can their parents say that? And then in the end, she's just saying that, yeah, have it removed, I'm not sure you can read it. And I was so angry. And, um, but then in the end, they were very nice to her son, you know? So what we can see here is, is lines. One is uh, blue, one is uh, greenish and, the upper panel is positive emotion. The lower panel is negative emotion uh, from, from this from asymmetry. And one is from the traveler, from the patient, or, and the other is from the guide. And what we can see here is a part where she then says, the, the patient, that during this guided imagery, she saw her grandma coming towards her uh, so they were listening to music and then the therapist is asking, so what do you hear? What do you see? What do you feel? And then a narrative develops. And in this part, which is this uh, moment of interest here, she sees her grandma coming towards her, telling her not to worry. And she was absolutely relieved. And then she says, oh, my love, that's so much beauty. Uh, like there's something coming from my grandma like she's telling me not to worry. And you can see how she's gradually building up a positive emotion. And um, of course, now we could look at the overall negative and positive emotions. I, I don't want to spare you that because here it is the turning point for her. Uh, she received, she gained hope during that moment in which she got that message. And as therapists, we know that this subtle embedded aesthetic processes of it. And you won't believe it, but there was a, a Berlioz piece played in the background about Jesus uh, being potentially slaughtered, but uh, Mary and Joseph going back or out of, uh, of uh, fleeing from Herodes. And so that is the music that is running in the background and singing about God bless the child, something like this, you know, absolutely crazy when we found out about that it really had goosebumps and yes yeah, so that was the turning point and see we can give data to that experiences to these moments in therapy and of course then we can start looking at different scores and so on and we can also see and this is just looking like waveforms but actually it is again uh, another moment of interest where the therapist and the patient felt very close. So both were women, both were thinking about upbringing a child. Interesting, you are being now on a maternity leave and uh, maternity award, uh, <clears throat> Filippo. Uh, so they are, she, they are very much connected. So, and when you look at the cross correlation, you see there's a significant uh, cross correlation at that Lex minus and zero, so which means they were really much in tune. So we can show that kind of being in tune, being, yeah, I almost felt the leap in my heart when she mentioned that her mother experienced the same problems, re realizing generational con impact of it. I felt very connected to her. And that is how it then looks like in the data. Right, so now I could go into something like that and stroke uh, rehabilitation, but I, don't want to go 
too much into all these techy pictures of moments where therapy, where connection starts. But um, here, in this case, again, moments of interest, moments of no interest, and then we're looking at overlaps here. So this is a particular overlap where the therapist and also the patient have agreed that, well, that is an interesting part of the therapy. So let's look into the data there. And what it was, a moment of encounter, I put my hand on the patient's shoulder. That was a beautiful moment. She stopped shaking you know, of his tremor there, opened his eyes and he said that he's been at the very nice place. And the, the patient says, well, it was a moment like Tai Chi. He felt the feeling of having an energy ball between his hands, only in his mind. And he felt the warmth of that energy ball. Interestingly enough, you can see here antiphase of that frontal asymmetry. So negative, positive emotions, a positive emotion on the top. And then here, the, pay, the therapist starts humming and has the hand on the shoulder of the patient who's getting relaxed, starting breathing differently. And what you can see is how the brain waves are, you know, where they are getting really in sync in, in, on the same wavelength. They are both kind of being connected. And uh, this is then how it looks like. I just want to play the video here. Sorry, it looks a bit awful. He sees prayer. Now she's putting the hand on. I don't need to tell that. Start singing. Yeah, so another moment in which music is, yeah, being that kind of medium, the arts, a medium to connect and to get in touch. I'm not sure how we are on times. I could go into an um, improvisation music therapy session where we also did that, but I can also stop here. So over to you, I'm not sure because, um, yeah, that's a bit of a longer piece right now, maybe. So sit so Tinder and what do you think? So just go on. That might be three, four minutes, I guess. Yeah, shall I? Okay, Alzheimer. No, sorry. A patient with a rare form of a familiar, familiar, sorry, my talking early onset Alzheimer's disease. Part of a session in which um, as a first drum improvisation that we have rated as a moment of interest and a second drum improvisation. And yeah, we were wondering how during these uh, sessions we can see look at uh, synchronized brain activity and interbrain coupling between the music therapist and clients so this is a bit of a different measure where you can look at the the lax and anteriority which is then you know telling you about being before or behind the brain activity of somebody related well i can show that a little bit and yeah the, then we look into the improvisation it's such and this spider web here is an average on how it looks like uh, during this moment of interest the drumming and the red colors that you can see are the outgoing strength of the eg towards the patient and the yellow the bluish are the ones going out from the patient towards the uh, the therapist and what we can see, of course, here is that during this moment of interest, the therapist is really much, you know, going into, is totally with, with, with the patient, is really trying to match and trying to help, trying to support, not to show I'm the better player because I can play, no, really trying to support. And uh, this is a moment of no interest where we do not see that kind of outgoing where the therapist is not really also therapeutically not aiming to uh, to to do what she's done during that moment of interest and um, 
there is an increased coupling during this moment of interest and it suggests that the therapist is more focused on the patient and the interaction while the client is focused more on himself. Well, he's a drummer. He is a drummer with 30 years onset uh, of, uh, of Alzheimer. So he knows what it is to stay on the groove, to be in time, to be on the metric. But um, when we look at the, the music data, just analyzing the media data um, and using these tools with no density and pulse clarity, where we can sh look a little bit on how the rhythmic or metric pulsation over time develops and who is more or less leading or um, the, the playing in terms of the amount of notes, but also in terms of how the, the these notes are um, building up rhythmical patterns, and then, um, yeah, how that can be perceived from a listener, and then how that is um, expressed as the strongest periodicity common to both players in terms of synchronicity, we can then see with this patient that, um, during the, uh, the moment of interest, drum improvisation, there's a high unbuilding and peaks of synchronicity. It is left from the therapist here, as you can see it's leaning towards that direction. While in, in another session here, it is more also that the, the patient is, is leading the playing, but as it, this confirms a little bit how, what we're looking at in the in the brain data that the therapist is kind of being very much supportive and um, yeah and and while also doing that in the moment of no interest uh, we can see these arrows well what these arrows mean here there the the, the the drama is losing track of the timing so he's playing wrong you know to be say it like this and yes so after the video recording the therapist commented that being a musician you can see the, that with this uh, the, um, Alzheimer he can see the decline in his drumming since the onset of his dementia and he was very focused on playing correctly although this could at times be difficult for him he was very aware of when he was struggling to stay on the beat so, and this seems to be related to initiating the arm movement. So, of course, there is also a, a problem of not being able, like in stroke, to, 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 to do that. But uh, with the help, and once he found the steady beat, he was able to play continuously. And the therapist was fully focusing on that and uh, trying to support that, while at the same time, she, wanted, she didn't want to bring him in a situation where his arm movements that are not allowing him to play the drama as he was is um, is uh, yeah restricting that and now what we can see here is the last bit where they are playing together and um, and where you can see that that he's he's already now with his focus and attention focus also but Where she uh, but well it's not working anymore that was also the gesture there and so and that was the second drama presentation and as I said we can see that there's a few yeah, let's say problems with being on the time. So of course she didn't want to do that. So that's why I say she is not focusing very much on him like she did here. And so, yeah, this is what we can do with the social neuroscience stuff. And um, this is what I wanted to show you so that what the arts, what, the art, what is in the process of the arts, it's quite complex and we can only get there when we leave the arts doing what they want to do when they can really flourish and get to it not asking to do a certain a certain protocol because then the arts cannot really you know get into that interaction but what we can is just try to accompany set up uh, a way of how we then you know can revisit the data postdoc yes and that is then what is giving us this kind of insight but yes these are just case studies but these are human beings persons that had a good time and they were doing it uh that's it
Thank you, Yogi. That's fascinating, actually. It's really like taking a walk in people's, you know, musicians' brains. It, and uh, we're going to dive a little more into um, the listening uh, with our last panelist. Uh, Stephanie Loveless is a sound and media artist whose research centers on listening and vocal embodiment. Uh, research projects include geolocated listening, sound works that channel voices of plants, animals, musical divas. Uh, her work has been presented widely in festivals, galleries and museums, and artist-run centers worldwide. Um, supported by international grants and awards. She's a lecturer at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York and the United States. And she's also uh, the director of the Center of Deep Listening for Deep Listening. Deep Listening is a practice that is uh, widely used by contemporary musicians these days, as well as participants from other disciplines, interests, etc. Is a practice that is conceptualized and initiated by Pauline Oliveros, an American composer and pioneer of post-war experience Experimental and electronic music. So Stephanie is, uh, we're very happy to have you with us today. And I think she's going to even demonstrate what that would be. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. How should I um, think about time? Should I give myself a little time limit or should I just share what I have to share? Okay. Maybe somebody can just like unmute and, and nudge me if, if needed. Um, and I'm very glad you're, that you had slides because I'm feeling a little bit nerdy, but I do also have slides. Um, okay, let me actually see if this really works. Like yes. How is that? Are my slides in, the, in a reasonable manner? Um, Okay, let's see, actually, I'm so sorry. Let's see if this will work. Um, doink, doink, yes, that will work nicely. Beautiful, okay. Um, so yeah, let us, um, oh wait, that's not gonna work, is it? Did that just show my little notes? Did it? Yes, ugh. All right, let me just make this one a little smaller. Um, we're just going to be beginning with an exercise. So I don't really need too much in the way of notes, but I just wanna be able to move forward my slides because there are moments um, where I will wanna share things with you. Um, so uh, I wanted us to start with a listening and breathing and perhaps even sounding exercise. Um, and I know that we can't um, see each other all necessarily, um, and perhaps even panelists, if you would feel more comfortable turning off your cameras for now, you can, uh, and we can't hear each other, but um, perhaps we can still connect in with the rhythms of our own bodies and perhaps even somehow virtually with each other. Stephanie, if you want, I can allow everybody to talk. So everybody can, you can have the breath if you want as a sound. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you, though. So uh, how about we begin by getting comfortable, right? We might have been sitting in a little bit of a stiff position. Maybe you even want to move somewhere uh, a little bit away from your screen and stretch and do whatever it might be take to make you comfortable and then come to a relative stillness. Um, at this point, you might uh, soften your gaze or if you're comfortable, you can even close your eyes. And then begin by simply noticing your breathing. Just gently, observing. Observe the way that it moves your body. And be receptive to any sounds that you notice it making. And gradually, you might amplify whatever those sounds are that you notice. And 
you can maybe experiment with gradually introducing your voice just by allowing your vocal cords to vibrate with your breath, not in any particular way, but in whatever way occurs naturally. And here, no sound is more desirable than any other sound. But see if you can allow sound to emerge. with your breathing. You might find that this results in sighing sounds, rumbling sounds, or something else. And you can end with a synchronous inhalation and exhalation. So what we've begun practicing here is um, an exercise, uh, a sonic meditation uh, by Pauline Oliveros called Teach Yourself to Fly. You can see the score here. Um, it is meant for group participation um, and is part of this collection of scores that was first published in 1971 by Pauline Oliveros, who, um, as Chris noted, is uh, was a uh, pioneering um, electronic and uh, improvising music performer. Um, I often like to introduce her uh, through the way that she introduced herself in the introduction to the Sonic Meditations, which is a two-legged human being, female, lesbian, musician, composer, among other things. Um, so yes, I uh, am a sound artist, um, and since 2020, I've also been the director of the Center for Deep Listening here at Rensselaer. I began studying deep listening with Pauline in 2005. Um, I eventually became certified in the practice, and it's just been really foundational to everything that I do as an artist and even as a person, you would say. Um, so a little bit about deep listening, right? So um, as a term, deep listening means different things in different contexts in different parts of the world. Um, there's an Aboriginal um, Australian term, dadidi, which is for a, a word for a deep and respectful listening practice, which is often translated in English to deep listening. Um, there's Titnat Hans, um, then Buddhist um, sort of respectful listening practice that he calls deep listening. But um, the way that um, as kind of conceived and shared by Paul Oliveros, it's a very specific set of creative and collaborative practices for uh, mindful listening and creative sonic production. In her words, deep listening involves going below the surface of what is heard, expanding to the whole field of sound while finding focus. This is the way to connect with the acoustic environment, all that inhabits it, and all that there is. So, um, you know, she worked in many different areas, um, telematic music performance, um, adaptive musical instruments, um, you know, cutting edge electronic music, um, but it was really um, in her development of instruction scores that uh, deep listening became a, a collaborative practice that could be shared with others and taught and really developed a community of practitioners. Um, so, 
as I mentioned, this um, book was published in 1971, and there are many more scores and publications that came afterwards, but these ones are kind of foundational. Um, so what is an instruction score, sometimes called a text score? Um, it is uh, a way of um, delivering instructions to musicians and non-musicians with words rather than with notes on a page. So it becomes really accessible. And this is something that was really important to Pauline Oliveros that her practices and that actually music as a birthright be accessible even to people that you know, don't have instruments, don't have musical training, cannot read music. Um, so a couple of things that um, is able to happen in these kinds of scores is that, um, because the, uh, I'll, I'll share a few of the scores with you and you'll see that they're quite simple and open and really allow for participation um, from the group and contribution from the group. So in fact, everybody who's participating, first of all, if you're in the group, you are a participant. There is no kind of outside audience. Um, and also because everybody is really contributing from their own um, musical imagination. In fact, everybody is a co-creator of the piece. So this kind of breaks down those very staid musical hierarchies between performer and composer and audience. No, we're doing something completely different here. Um, and something that I find um, really important and central in all of these scores is that they are, um, they come from a place of, and they develop sort of receptive responsiveness. So you're always responding. You might be responding to the environment. You might be responding to others in the group um, and you might be doing both. Um, and in this, I, I just share this um, book and this term by uh, an indigenous sound studies scholar, fellow scholar, Dylan Robinson. Um, who talks about what he calls hungry listening, which is a kind of sort of settler colonial way of like listening, which is very instrumentalized uh, and instrumentalizing goal oriented. Um, and I'm interested in the way that these kind of deep listening practices um, can maybe model other ways of listening, right, which are more receptive and responsive. So we have a score like this from the publication, Sonic Meditations, Take a Walk at Night, Walk So Silently That the Bottoms of Your Feet Become Ears, um, or this one from 1976, By a River or Stream, Listening to the key tones in the rushing waters, Allow your voice to blend with the sounds that you hear. So here you can hear this way of um, the score directing the performer to tune, tune into and tune themselves to and with their environment in really to be beautiful ways. Um, and then, um, so these are kind of um, tuning to the environmental surroundings sorts of scores. Um, but in many, many of her scores, you're in fact tuning to other performers, one of her most famous and kind of widely performed and performed with like thousands of people uh, at Carnegie Hall or via Zoom uh, called the Tuning Meditation, um, asks performers to alternate between um, offering one long tone on one breath that is kind of from their imagination and that they don't believe that they are already hearing. So it's a sonic contribution. So um, going back and forth between doing that and tuning to actually actively matching somebody else's long tone, um, tuning to another, amplifying their voice. There's a lot of kind of beautiful metaphorical resonances there. Um, so he says, again, in the introduction, healing can occur in relation to the above activities when one, Individuals feel the common bond with others through a shared experience. Two, when one's inner experience is made manifest and accepted by others. Three, and, and I'm, I'm really uh, resonating with much of what we were talking about here, Amanda. 
Um, and three, when one is aware of and in tune with one's surroundings. Um, in process, a kind of music occurs naturally. Its beauty is not through intention, but is intrinsically the effectiveness of its healing power. And uh, in a second introduction, she says, with continuous work, some of the following becomes possible with sonic meditations. Heightened states of awareness or expanded consciousness, changes in physiology and psychology from known and unknown tensions to relaxations, which gradually become permanent. And these changes may represent a tuning of mind and body. So, um, so this is a kind of healing um, as Pauline Oliveros puts it, but this is a kind of a, a healing that is um, community-based um, and kind of comes from within rather than without and is never in isolation, is always sort of in resonant relationship. Um, and to me, that is uh, very important. Um, so um, I'll just share a little bit of, of my own work um, at the end here. Uh, this is a project called Listening Prescriptions uh, that I created for the O Positive Festival in Kingston, New York in 2021 during the pandemic. Um, and the project emerges from an earlier project in 2009 called Performance Prescriptions, where I was trying to explore performance art as a healing practice. Uh, and the process for that piece was gather ailments, psychic, physical, psychological, from individuals for which they would like to receive a cure. Um, so I turned back to the premise of this project. Um, well, wait a minute, I think I should, well, I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll, you'll get it. So, right, so I turned back to this project um, in the context of the festival. Uh, because the O Positive Festival is a really interesting festival where uninsured artists and musicians can come and receive health care in exchange for their art from nurses, doctors, dentists, body workers, and mental health professionals as well. Um, and so given that I had recently become the director of the Center for Deep Listening, and given that um, Pauline Oliveros lived in Kingston, New York for uh, many, many years, uh, it just seemed natural to reconceive that performance prescriptions piece as listening prescriptions. So I began by asking community members through postcards, a Google form, and one-on-one -on -one conversations about their relationship to sounds and their ideas about healing. Um, and I asked if they had an ailment for which they would be willing to, or they would like to receive a listening prescription. And this could be, um, I took care to say this could be like an interpersonal, a personal, a uh, political and ecological, like whatever they are feeling is impacting them and that they would like, hey, yeah, give me a cure for that. Um, so I wrote a listening prescription for each of the ailments that I received. Um, and then I made those public uh, during the festival through a listening dispensary. Um, so some of the ailments I received were physical, like uh, hip pain, belly issues, joint issues, cancer recovery, sluggishness, back pain, and pinched neck. Uh, some were personal, um, while arguably also systemic. Exhaustion, lack of balance, depression, uh, grief, being scattered, distrust of strangers and social anxiety. And some were clearly systemic, uh, white supremacy, being pulled in too many directions, overwhelm, and climate anxiety. So these were um, tall orders. Um, oh, right, and existential. Don't forget that hopelessness, loss of imagination, emotional numbness, lack of direction, loss of purpose, fear of mortality. So um, I um, was very careful to frame what I was doing uh, as an art practice, as I am not a trained health professional in any way. Um, but I was really interested in creating a little intervention that might open up different ways through listening, through connecting, inspired by deep listening, um, you know, that we might build community and agency around our own well being. Um, yeah. Sorry, I've lost my ability to move forward. Here we go. Um, 
so as I said, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a health professional, but since I became the director um, of the Center for Deep Listening, I have had the opportunity to be in touch with people who are bringing deep listening into different um, and very interesting places, um, such as the sound researcher, Alex DeLittle, um, who uh, has been actually with uh, stroke recovery patients doing a, um, a collaboration with the National Health Institute and uh, where he was meeting one-on-one -on -one with stroke recovery patients and doing deep listening practices with them and sort of tracking that to see what becomes possible. Um, there's also a uh, Chicago-based ensemble uh, called Fifth House, who was bringing deep listening practices into a range of social service organizations in Chicago um, and working with uh, people there from different walks of life um, and having them do deep listening practice and create their own scores as well as ways of sharing um, what they had experienced with others. Um, so I guess I'll, uh, closing thoughts. Um, so, you know, deep listening is uh, a creative and participatory practice and um, it's definitely quite unique in that way, um, but it also has a lot in common with mindfulness practices, right? Pauline studied uh, Zen, Tibetan Buddhism, Taoist forms, she was a black belt in karate. Um, and all of those influences are very apparent in her work. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I um, am really interested in being, in bringing like a lot of care and thought to how deep listening practices develop, keeping in mind the ways that so many wellness practices um, or mindfulness practices have kind of been co-opted by the wellness industry you know, um, and being just like used for, you know, to make better workers <laughs> who can work more because they're meditating on their breaks. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I will stop there um, and just say that it was really uh, wonderful to, to hear all of your work and perspective and I look forward to chatting more. Thank you, Stephanie, that was fantastic. I just wanted to point out to the attendees and panelists that Philippa will need to actually go um, a little earlier than everyone else. So if you would like uh, to, um, if you would like to ask her something or you're interested or even some you know, beautiful comments for her work, please go ahead now uh, before we start opening up actually for everybody to make comments. Yeah, or, or um, you know, get in touch directly because it might be hard to just suddenly uh, spring open a question. Mm -hmm. I, I can't believe how many babies have passed through this space while you've all been talking. I thought this was a quiet space. <laughs> Oof, it's quite, a, quite, quite emotional. So um, um, I just think there's so much connection with everything everybody said. I, I'm, I'm writing notes and my mind is just going, oh my goodness, how can we work together? you know, just so fascinating. And, and you know, um, Stephanie, I know you, I know it says your name is Satinda, but I know you're Stephanie. Um, <laughs> the ability to take that deep listening, to take the idea of a score, that improvisational anatomical presence, and the delight um, that comes from that, Jörg, you know, that autotelic moment where somebody is doing something for the sheer pleasure of it finding the flow in the interaction. And, and uh, I think, Stephanie, before you came on, I was talking about the theater of one. You know, when you come in as a dancer and you're at somebody's bed and you're working very intimately and people are, you know, you're literally standing over them. They, they, they can't go anywhere. They're, they've got bottles and drips and um, they're incarcerated. <laughs> um, the, the quietness and the skill needed to come in and offer something like a score. Um, so as a dancer, my own work is very much based on that score making and taking people out into the environment. I love the one about let your, um, let your feet become like ears out. Oh, yeah, beautiful. I, I, I use that work all the time. And just because you introduced it, Satinda, as well, I'm trying to wrap these things up, the idea of the ecology 
I'm in a hospital, it's a crazy building, but I know what it feels like for my feet to walk as if they are ears. And I bring that knowledge into the spaces with me. And as much as possible, I always start with saying, let's, let's look out the sky, look out the windows. We've actually got some amazing views here. Um, and my fascination, Jörg, and Amanda, you'll get this all the time, is I will sit with someone and we just both go into that place of deep listening. I can't invite somebody to do that and not do it myself. It's participatory. Philippa, yeah. there's and a question so, exactly on that what you're building right oh, now by oh. Caroline that says if yeah. you could say something about weather or how rhythm might be part of how you work with people. Which I think is where you're heading with all this building. Rhythm. What I was going to say, what often happens is I will be sharing the same image with people. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a tree and then when I ask them, they open their eyes and say, oh, I'm, I'm underneath my grandmother's tree in Wales. You just think, okay. <laughs> rhythm, I think rhythm, very much as um, Amanda introduced it, it comes through the breath. It comes very much through letting people understand the rhythm of their own breath and um, absolutely the nonverbal work of synchronizing into somebody else's rhythm. Um, training as a movement therapist, you know how your body is and what your body carries. And if I'm sitting with somebody and then feel extreme sadness or feel like my breath, my, my rhythm of being is being squeezed, I know there's something going on for somebody else. Uh, the skill lies in articulating that. You don't want to blurt that out and go, I think you're having problems breathing. You want to just slowly bring in some kind of an activity, a score, a piece of music, that clap. <laughs> I know it so well, that moment of let's play. Let's take ourselves out of our minds and just play. Let's enjoy this time together. I think that allows our rhythms to synchronize. My, my dissertation when I did my, my work at the Laban Center, Trinity, was all about interactional rhythms. And why is it that you can sit with a group of people who've been labeled as demented, as in out of their minds, will establish a rhythm of being together, a rhythm of singing together, or of moving together, it's tiny movements, simple movements, and suddenly they're telling you their life stories. You know, it's um, like, who's the demented person in this room? Show me, because I'm not, I'm not feeling dementia here. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm saying that lightly because I'm, I'm about to go. But yeah, there's a lot. There's one, one more, if you could, um, a little bit fast. Um, um, Susan was saying that you spoke of listening hands. And could you expand on the evocative phrase, please? Yeah, listening hands is one of the key tools. Um, your, in your um, film, the, the music therapist put her hand on the shoulder. So it's essential that um, in this kind of a clinical environment, although I take it into all work everywhere, but this clinical environment where hands are used to prod, to take blood, to poke, to lift, to haul, to wash, that you have a pair of hands that arrive into the body space, into the personal space, into that potential for articulating what's going on. And my hands are just listening. They're sensing, but they're not massaging. They're open. They're not guiding. I'm often putting my hands on people's shoulders because that's a fairly safe body place. And I talk about my hands being a nest. And I invite people to move into my hands. So how would it feel? How does it feel to move? Where does your shoulder want to go? How is your shoulder? So taking that personal phenomenological approach, you know, what's happening right here, right now? Oh, that feels very painful. It's like, okay, well, where is the pain? How can we shift it? So people can understand that uh, as lightly as possible, the connection between the mind, the brain, and the body. If I bring in the word nest, you can see people just relax. If I say I'm going to clamp my hands onto your shoulder, you can see people tense up. Obviously, right, Jörg? You know, so, yeah. But that's often the way they are being touched and handled. People get handled. So to come into a space where they can allow their body to direct the mind to, to, to play with that interactivity is, 
is the listening hand. And of course, I'm receiving information, you know, through my hands, and I'm also passing on information. But that's like a whole series of workshops that hopefully Amanda will be creating with your new charity. <laughs> I'm so sorry to go because I feel like I'm about to miss the richest bit. So I hope we can all hook up together again. And thank you so much. Thank everybody. you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Rich, so what a thank rich you. engagement. I'm sorry about yeah, appearing. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, bye. Bye. Bye, Philippa. Thank you so much. Bye, I would like to, to point out that at this point, we, we talked about art um, as a social activity rather than an art object. And we talked about no formal distinctions between an artist and an audience or um, a patient and a therapist um, that uses utilizes kind of similar uh, processes, it, but they're still performative events. And I would like to ask our participants, in music, I kind of know because I'm coming from there, but how would you frame uh, how do you frame this kind of interactions with an Amanda? How do you frame a, a, a seance? Like, is it, as we would say, a free improv or are there um, directions that you want to, um, to to put your participants in? And uh, how do you make those decisions? What, what do you watch for and how do you go for that? Okay, so if we were to play a game, let's say a clapping game, for example, there are always instructions to any game um and while sessions are very improvisational there those structures remain to keep everyone very safe and as facilitator um it's my responsibility to make sure everyone is very safe at all times and for people with very complex mental health issues and maybe a lived experience of trauma that is very important so that they do feel free to be able to creatively collaborate with me and the rest of the group so whilst I totally agree, I don't uh, really adhere to the confines of expert and participant. My role in the responsibility of managing that room is important to uh, formulate. Um, but once the instructions are given over, I too will make mistake and uh, I not only don't hide my mistakes, I celebrate my mistakes in the game also. So it gives permission to other uh, members of the group to also uh, safely fail. Um, and so it does become very collaborative in the session with all of us. A lot of the time we are in a circle. And if we do separate off into smaller groups, those groups will also mimic smaller circles as well, which are very important especially for listening. I just have a, um, a quick a question. Um, you know, lockdown and how our society is reconfiguring so that, you know, many people in corporations and workplaces and government jobs are still working from home. Um, it, you know, it, this, the deep listening, this this way that you engage with people, um, the, po the possibility to arrive at these moments. Um, what are the uh, what is your um, what do you think of you know people who could be isolated and highly dependent on you know this mediating via by technology. I know it's a, it seems like an adjunct question, but it's um, it's affecting so many of us and part of the reason why people are stressed. And, um, yes, I think one of the groups I would like to touch upon perhaps is young people. So we are now seeing the ramifications of that social isolation within that group whose education went online for some children and young people who maybe had one device per household um, meant that they weren't able to complete lessons. Um, friend groups broke down. Now for a teenager, we know it is natural for them to reject their parents and for their tribe of friends to become so important. And that was very much stunted during the pandemic. And so those social bonds have broken down your best friend, which is so important to you as a teenager, maybe isn't your best friend when you return to school. 
um, your education is behind, but also their emotional maturity is very much behind. We've seen uh, in schools across the UK where um, teenage girls, there's been a big spike in physical violence within girls. Um, there's a lot of pent up anger what happened. Um, also, let's remember during the pandemic, we had big surges in, you know, you know, we look at George Floyd in America that had such an impact here as well in the UK. When we look at the riots, we look at the war in Ukraine, all of these things that they say. So there was social isolation, but also young people were seeing things on screens at home. Um, and so all those kind of pent up emotions were part of it in the return to school. And schools are under pressure to get uh, children's marks back up. They don't have time to work on the real emotional uh, difficulties that children are having and their mental health. You bring also into the NHS waiting list being 18 months minimum for a child to get mental health interventions in the UK. Then for a child who is already behind in their education, if they are on a waiting list and their parents can't afford private mental health care for their child, that child is going further behind. And what's happening is those child, instead of getting talking therapies or arts therapies, a lot of them are being medicated. And we know that those medications can have an effect on that growing brain. And so that child then gets further behind and their friends move on and they don't move on. And that child is then stuck in a system of just being a passive participant in their own life. They're just a recipient of care. Um, and so when we do projects in schools, uh, it's about trying to re-engage them, uh, first of all, into living before we even talk about school. And the hope is eventually to get them back into that state. But it is the new epidemic for sure across schools. When we look at social isolation, when we look at the bullying that happens on social media, which is also magnifying that social isolation even further. Amanda, since you were talking about this social, um, um, I know that um, you get also funds from external organizations and even governmental organizations. Could you elaborate a little bit? How do you assess um, art workshops, you know, for mental health or with people with disabilities for, you know, to get actually funding from this kind of, uh, you know, organization? So I generally will do a lot of creative consultation before a new project. I try to be as user led as possible um, throughout. Uh, so for Good Mood Creative, we're currently working with an educational psychologist who's designing really interactive um, evaluation forms for children and young people. And we're really exploring how do we really measure and evaluate our work so that then will also in time help us with funders and the government uh, and the decision makers, but also for us to know that our work is working and ways that we can improve as well. And what does that, what does it mean a little bit for you? Would you like to develop? How do you assess? A session and how do you evaluate the outcome? I always so one thing, especially with my adults, I find sometimes, especially in Britain, people are a little bit too polite sometimes when it comes to uh, evaluation. Oh, it was fine. It was lovely. It was lovely. Um, and I want people to feel really safe in being able to say how they feel. So I always welcome at the end of sessions to talk about things, talk about what they enjoyed, what they felt challenged with, and I will always lead and say what I felt worked, what I felt maybe didn't work. Um, and so it gives them also permission. I always give out pieces of paper and pens at the end and they can write in and for my longer term groups, they have a little uh, notebook and they can have a little journal in there. And I always say, you can write me a little letter and tell me what really bugs you about me. Um, and, you know, I really, really dare them to do that. It's really important that I know what's working. And when we come back the following session, before we start, especially in my longer term programs, I say, how did you feel uh, on Tuesday night? If we had session on a Tuesday afternoon, how did everyone feel Tuesday night? How did you feel Wednesday morning? And they might say, oh, I was feeling good, but by Thursday I was in a grumpy mood again. When we talk about the tools that they have, 
from class that they can use at home, a breathing exercise while the kettle's boiling, for example. Um, and so the evaluation, I try really to see as a collaborative thing that we do together and we do it all of the time. The art sometimes is too guilty of adding on evaluation as a tack on at the end to um, please our funders. But for me, it's a really important tool to really measure how we're doing um, and so we can pivot if needs be. Yeah. And in music, I know um, because I do a lot of improvisation, etc. there's one gorging uh, kind of element is engagement. Um, and I would like to ask either you or Gore, Stephanie, whoever would like to talk a little bit about that. Is that an important element in evaluating, um, you know, therapists with patient sessions, the engagement and the self, um, how would you say, self-motivation or um, for any of you? Maybe York, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, there it is, uh, the button. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, it depends when you think about a session, music therapy session, uh, of course, depends on what is the background. But uh, independent of that, if you are starting to play, you want to overcome first, of course, that uh, idea that I can't play. You know, I've not learned to play, you know, so and that uh, there's certain ways of just going around that by showing that uh, whatever is done, whatever is producing sound is then, you know, starting to talk in a way that is not needing words. So and and to have that ability i mean you can depending i say if, you know anxiousness you, you can kind of course play that you can kind of play that this 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 hiding in a way and and you can make it um really like a like a <clears throat> yeah like an embodying of of what what you are internally feeling but of course, the engagement is, is, is central to it. So to bring people there, and I mean, if you have somebody who says, no, nope, no, no, I don't want to, no. You know, I mean, of course, then you can make the no, I don't want to, yeah, it's a rhythm. You know, you can play with that. You can you make use of, of all the kind of signs that somebody gives to you, you know, even like a blink, you can play the blink and, uh, or uh, respond to it. And I think this is, then when when it becomes clear but i mean therapy is the place where somebody comes to receive help you know that's the healing contract that starts so i mean that's why you're getting all these kind of certificates in the end for some reason so that you are a person that you can be approached and then of course uh, there is also other than what amanda said where you have maybe you know kids in school that certainly get you know, to you are labeled as being, yeah, whatever, you know, this or that, uh, uncommunicative or you know, unresponsive or violent, whatever. And then some of them, they the best they try to do at the beginning is just to, no, I'm not doing this. And yeah, you can start playing using all the behavior as a musical, you know behavior and then make it make bring it into music and i mean with stephanie you would go definitely into that kind of well getting into the sound the relaxation and the and the states and i think engagement is, is central central to bring them there no matter what kind of patients we're looking at because that's what then helps in, in normal, I mean, I'm, I'm coming completely now from the music um, uh, interactions. When we have this uh, participatory larger group events, um, there is there is this clocking effect with a wall of sound, right? There's usually small repetitive things that go on. So people who have absolutely no skill set whatsoever, they feel safe to just go in and do something. How do you deal with the silence? Because you start from nothing. You start from... I mean, Stephanie would know that because she has been directing um, interactions like that that start from no sound. Um, and how do you deal with this kind of social, a little bit fear for participation rather than and judgment most probably? 
if you're asking Stephanie there, right? Should I pop in? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe we, we, or if we, you would like to, both of you actually, whenever, yeah. yeah. Shall I? Yeah, please. Um, sure. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely starting from, from silence and, you know, I, I will lead workshops centers and things like that, but more often, I am leading a group of, you know, 20, 19 year olds who are engineering students and are just taking an odd elective, right? And so um, there is definitely um, something that has to uh, happen. And so, so some of the strategies that I use are being really comfortable with silence, allowing listening to be considered active participation and enough. Um, and then, um, and then uh, you know, kind of what uh, I think Amanda was saying about you know every game has a set of instructions. So really framing things as exercises and games rather than scores for my students helps a lot. Um, and you know, often the, the sillier that it is, the better. And what I have found is is the most wonderful thing. Um, in terms of having everybody be engaged is when I have students um, write scores for each other and for the class as a whole so that they are then leading and not me. Um, and I, I don't know if it's the language that they're speaking that is just more resonant to their peers or if it's again, you know, I, I don't try, I'm, you know, we're always, I'm always like teaching in the round. I'm not trying to have, the, but the teacher student hierarchy exists, right? Like one of my assessments is student evaluations. One of their assessments is grades. Um, and so having the sort of um, peer to peer work really um, opens things up and, and gives them a bit more freedom. And so usually my main uh, way of assessing, okay, this class went well is when by the end of the semester, they're kind of like uh, moving around and able to like improvise in, in different ways and make, you know, silly vocal and even breath sound. All of that is, can feel quite intimate and vulnerable for students. One response maybe to silence or, I mean, silence can be very productive and uh, it depends when the silence starts or if this silence is at the very beginning and it's 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 feeling uncomfortable of course yeah and they start making something but if something has happened that was uh, good or that was you know set you know saturated whatever there is a silence that's kind of enjoying that and it, i mean in psychotherapy you have moments of silence when you don't speak you know but with this presence i mean in this example from the two uh, yeah from the first example that i was showing the first case they were just listening. They were not talking anymore. In guided imagery, you're talking about what you're seeing, but it wasn't needed anymore. They were totally just focusing on, on the voice that was starting singing and they were just going along that. So that was the silence, but of course there was music there. But uh, I mean, I don't want to talk about Cage who then kind of makes the sound in the in the audience and, and so on. But the Finns, I mean, I've lived in Finland, you know, silence is is essential. Well, and I started understanding that when I was really completely in the out in the nature. And when you, when you start feeling yourself being part of it, and every word that you say is kind of destructing the sounds of that silence, you know, in the nature, of course, that's nature sounds then, but also when it's really quiet. So, and that kind of presence to, to, to experience and to bring in can for some just to just walk out and say, well, that was something I needed to learn. I mean, I have seen, thesis master thesis where they're just trying to handle that silence in a way so and uh, that it is productive as well but yeah you need to <laughs> you need to accept it if it's uncomfortable for both well of course then you want to get rid of it but when you feel it's comfortable brilliant you know. and i think i would add that silence can be really powerful in a Absolutely. participatory setting um Clown uh, employs a lot of silence at the right time. And it's yes. a real chance both on stage and in a participatory setting for a reset for me. So sometimes when I feel we need a little bit of a gear change, I'll just employ a moment of silence. And sometimes for certain groups, I'll say ready. 
and there's a moment of complete silence and they wait to begin with. And sometimes there's a giggle and sometimes people shuffle a little bit in the silence. But in time, it can, silence can become really collaborative and there can be micro gestures and we might start moving and someone else might lead a little bit of a movement and we find new moments of collaboration in that silence. But it's so powerful when it comes to really having that opportunity for sometimes a gear change, but really a deeper level also of connection with your group. I think the strong thing is really when is something happening you know i think this kind of timing when the silence as you said it amanda you know sometimes you just want to avoid certain things to happen and but then when you really get into that deep process you know then uh yeah so i think effectiveness in in all our interventions related to if we really match the needs and do the right things at the right time uh, so and and the only way of, of getting there is trying to 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 trust the the intuition you know and, and learning to 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 use that and, and to train intuition in a way so as you say you know but of course you can elicit certain things but anyway so yeah totally i i was just thinking about something Jorg said, um, that really to go deep into understanding what's going on, um, that want, you know, it's important to avoid, you said, the rituals of experimental design. Um, and I think this is something that you know, as we come from the sciences, as we come from different methods and methodologies, how it is that we engage and still are able to conduct, you know, scientific work within artistic practice and mm -hmm. vice versa for artists to really do their art without being, um, having to conform or shape themselves to, scientific requirements is uh is is is, is really uh, challenging and um and um and important so that they work we work together um so i think the the work that you're doing is a, a really interesting example a valuable example for how we need to think about situating um even the methods that we evolve and develop in order to have this mutual um, beneficial understanding of processes and and to inform the work and even to evaluate what's going on. Um, mm. And you mentioned about the large scale data gathering that is required by say the NHS. Um, um, and when I, I know that some years ago we had this conference where we were talking about large scale and small scale. So somebody can work for many, many years with one person and they know that this person has hugely benefited and evolved and developed. And then other people want these large stats, you know, almost impersonal, depersonalized data. Um, and then it's all standardized in order to be able to gather the information. So it's, uh, you know, the it's interesting listening to all of you about how you are going about thinking about methods approaches what 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 is the finding um, 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 I wonder if maybe any of you could speak to some of the challenges or ways that you found your way in order to address this um, I mean Amanda you said um, um, you've already responded to some of that about how you're doing your evaluation and uh, and the arts council and other funding. Yeah, sort of but I think that also there are you're, you're right. There are real challenges. A lot of the time, the artist is seen as the poor cousin in the research, mm. or the less learned um, than the scientist because. 
the arts is seen as so subjective, as if the science is so uh, assured. Um, and so I think a mutual respect is absolutely very important. And the scientists I have worked with, when it has gone well, they generally have also that spirit of playfulness and curiosity yes. and openness. And yes. so they have that clown spirit in them already. And that's what makes those collaborations flow really well. We have that respect and collaboration when it comes to that curiosity. Um, the more formal approaches probably less suit my work. Um, working with a neuroscientist um since january uh she has an appreciation for the performing arts she uh is curious as to my application and our curiosity in each other's fields means that um we collaborate really well even though they're very different fields of practice so i uh am not a scientist uh, and, and I have collaborated a bit with a, with a cognitive scientist um, on some workshops where we did do some data gathering, but um, as, a, as something that is a creative practice, it doesn't, like, I think the, the two things that have me not be drawn to this kind of data gathering, um, maybe, maybe there's three things, let's see. Um, you know, one is that it seems like the, it's supposed to show that everybody will benefit from this. Um, and I don't think that that is the case actually, you know, for, for deep listening, um, right? Those very basic practices, like as you, as you were saying, like even focusing on breath for everyone is not um, beneficial, right? Uh, and so especially something like deep listening where you're supposed to be using your voice trained or not to like invent sounds for many people that will be scary and it's not something that they're interested in and maybe they could become interested and maybe not and that is fine. Um, I have no desire for um, deep listening to be mandatory for all, um, you know, and um, yeah, and then and then just that the way that we're set up is that you know people do courses, um, and that those courses they pay a certain amount, which pays the facilitators, and so it's not that we're government funded, so we haven't needed to do that kind of thing, um, but there is a way that just certain um, standards can then actually change what it is that you're doing. Suddenly you have to be doing things in a certain way in order to fulfill something. Um, yeah, so I think it's very, it's very interesting and actually even just hearing what you all are sharing is making me begin to think about some ways that I might be able to approach doing this. So I'm, I'm very grateful for the conversation. Maybe just a very quick, quick remark on that. So what we've seen in music therapy is that a lot of the, let's say, measuring to the metrics or psychometrics, whatever it is, they are not necessarily the, uh, real, yeah, built up from the arts process. So, and they're not reflecting the arts process and what we are doing as artists. And uh, um, so they are limited in their in their validity, validity, because the, you cannot really use that. Uh, and but then, to describe the arts process um, is is quite tricky in a way. So long story short, um, the collaboration, of course, if there is a, a neuroscientist who has an interest in the arts and has an understanding and has done arts, uh, sees that there is something in the uniqueness that a, an artist wants to strive for, while every kind of scientist wants to have generalizability in a way. So we have, you know, this kind of number, um, the wish to have the common, nomin common denominator, where the artist would say, no, I don't want to be average. You know, I am unique, you know, and that's where we want to bring their patients to. They want to show, well, this is your potential. So, <clears throat> but getting there, I mean, we have, ways of, of getting there but with certain um, agendas and certain manuals in 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 in, to, in in the treatment but the artist's process 
is always related to the moment in which the art is starting to live, where the sound becomes meaningful and where, the, where there is, where, where you can kind of sense there is something going on in the, in the moment. With, and that's what the audience, if you're a good performer, you can interact with the audience and you bring them, you give the people what they want, you know, because you feel it. And that's something that you can't plan. And so we have to rethink medical paradigms. They're not working in the arts. You know, if we treat, we need, the, this is, you know, the medical paradigms are based on substances you know the whole issue of medication is based on substance and and for for very very good reasons i'm happy that it is done like that but when we try to fit in with our arts processes we will always fail because yeah we are talking to john we are talking to mary we are working with with with, with lucy's problem you know and the group of john lucy and so sorry I'm just you know, it's not short what i said <laughs> We're thinking medical paradigms, I think, in the end, we have to do it differently. Yes, yes, that's a, it's, it's a, it's a discussion, it's a, it's a discussion, it's an important one. And that's wonderful, I, th I think on that note, I think we'll, we'll thank all of you for being with us. Thank you so much for coming and th thanks to our audience for being with us and um, look forward to the next one. Thank you so much.